thank you to that worship ensemble and for all the worship that we enjoy, the music and the blessing of Christmas. It's such a special time. Let me join with Dr. Hopkins in saying we are going to miss our college students while they are away during their Christmas break. Not just the ones that play in the orchestra, but everybody else too. We have been so blessed with some outstanding young people who have become a part of our church and part of our worship. And we are going to miss you guys when you're gone. And we look forward to seeing you when you get back. So have a great Christmas. And we'll save you seats until you get back, okay? Said the night wind to the little lamb, do you see what I see way up in the sky, little lamb? Do you see what I see? A star, a star way up in the night with a tail as big as a kite. Have you ever thought about how much what they saw had to do with the people who were involved in the coming of Jesus? Just a few moments ago we read a scripture together, a scripture about the prediction of the coming of the Savior, the promise that it was just around the corner. As an angel came to Zacharias, and the Bible says the angel appeared to Zacharias. It says Zacharias saw him. We are remembering that it really was a, the night wind that saw the star. It was the three wise men or the wise men who traveled to find the new king. It was the shepherds who had an angel host who appeared to them on a, on a hillside to tell them that Christ had come. Everywhere you look in the Bible, it's all about what people saw. Last week we talked about do you hear what I hear. Today I want to talk to you about do you see what I see? Because Christmas is really about the things that you see. I hope you had a great time this past Friday. I know that the snow got in the way of a lot of things. I, uh, we had uh, several parties that we were going to be a part of with some of your Sunday school classes that we didn't get to attend. We had some other events that didn't take place. Uh, Jim and Pat were planning on being married this morning, and we're going to put that off till this afternoon. And that's uh, Friday evening, and that's going to be exciting. And but it was still nice to see the snow, wasn't it? It was nice to see the snow. If ever there's been a perfect snowstorm in Birmingham, it was what happened this past Friday because we got three or four inches of beautiful with roads that never froze over, and it was all gone and passed away yesterday, except in the shady places. It's a perfect time. Judith and I got out Friday evening about dusk when we could tell that the roads had kind of cleared out again and we rode around the neighborhoods near our house and we looked at the lights, lights in the trees and lights on the homes and the things that people had put out and it was just extra beautiful because it was all covered with a blanket of snow. That's the way Christmas ought to look, isn't it? Because Christmas is a holiday for the eyes. Everybody goes to extra trouble to make things a little more beautiful at Christmas. Whether it's outside your house or inside your house, whether you've got a hundred people coming at some time during the holidays, or whether you're going to be there just by yourself, there's just something about Christmas that makes you know, I want things to be a little more beautiful than they've been. Well, I just bragged on the two of y'all, and you just walked in the door. So we look forward to this afternoon with Jim and Pat. I told them when we thought the wedding was going to be Friday, by the way, I, I, I told them I was going to get up in church this morning and I was going to say, you know, about a year ago, Pat Spain joined our church. And she got so active. She was so involved in Sunday school and part of the choir and all the things that are going on around here. And we really enjoyed having Pat Spain as part of our church. And, and I just was going to have to announce to you this morning that Pat Spain wasn't going to be coming to our church anymore. <laughs> but Pat Blanton will be. And we're excited about that. We're thrilled for them. And so I'll, I'll say that next week. How about that? Everything about Christmas is about beauty. It reminds me of a story about a father who had his competitive juices uh, flowing one Christmas. 
his neighborhood had announced, we're going to have a contest this year. We're going to see who has the most beautiful home during the Christmas season. And he thought, this is my chance. For months, he planned what his home was going to look like during Christmas. He sat down and wrote it all out and drew pictures, the nativity scene in this part of the yard, the snowman over there, Santa and the reindeer up on the roof, scores of strings of lights, dozens of extension cords, hundreds of lights, enough floodlights to light an airport. He had it planned. Finally, the night came when it was time to put it all together. And he gathered his family together and he gave them a pep talk. He talked about the beauty of Christmas, about the joy of displaying their home for other people to, to, uh, to enjoy and to drive by and to see. And the glory of having that first prize sign in the middle of the front yard. And then he said, okay, team, now let's go out there and let's make this the best Christmas ever. For a moment, there was silence. And then his five-year-old said, but Dad, how can any Christmas be better than the first Christmas? It's a good question, isn't it? To stop and ask ourselves as we begin to move into what I call the frantic season. The frantic season is the last half of the month of December when everybody's trying to get everything done, go everywhere you're supposed to go, buy everything you're supposed to buy, see everybody you're supposed to see, and you just run from place to place to Christmas night. So this morning, I want us all to try to put aside the lights and the wrapping paper and the sights of Christmas so that we can see what really matters. This is what I want to invite you to do this morning. I want you to join me in trying to see through the eye. Of all the people involved in the Christmas tale, I identify with these fellows. Just ordinary guys. Angels were the last thing they expected to see. Miracles were the furthest thing from their minds. And the first time you look into their eyes, I think you would see that half-sleepy look that comes from working the night shift. If that's ever been you, you know exactly what I mean. If you've ever worked the night shift, you understand that time between 2 and 3 in the morning when everything you needed to do when you first got there has kind of been done and you're in between the things you're going to have to do before you can go home and it just gets kind of quiet and sleepy. They never expected anything amazing to happen. But it did. The Bible says they saw a bright light. It's an angel chorus. It says they heard an incredible con an that pronouncement. Christ had come. That promise that God had made so long ago, it had taken place. Not only had he come, he had come to save. The Bible says that the angel pronouncement was that God had finally sent that, pe that uh, Messiah who was going to save his people from their sin. And then he said, he had come to save them. Born unto you. I don't know if we can imagine or understand what an incredible pronouncement that was. When that angel said to that ragdag band of men, born to you. Because they had grown up in a religious system in which they were the least and the less likely to ever be noticed by God. These were not the people that were known for their holiness. This is not the people who were known for their influence. These were not the great people of the world. These were the humblest of all. And the angel said, born to you, Christ has come. Christ has come to save. Christ has come to save you. And if there's anything we need to hear on Christmas time, that's what we need to hear. Christ came to save you and me and all of us. Not the famous, not the mighty, not the wealthy, us. Theirs are the eyes of every person who has ever felt the call of Jesus in their hearts. When you begin to ask yourself those questions, can it be true? Does Jesus really know who I am? Does he really care about me? Is there really room for me in his kingdom, me, just the way I am? 
with all of my flaws and all of my brokenness and all of my sin? Does Jesus really love me? Yes. Can you see? Can you see that Jesus came to save you? He didn't come to be a baby in a manger. He didn't come to be celebrated once a year. He has a place in the kingdom. I would love to look into the eyes of the shepherds as the angel chorus disappeared and as the sky became quiet again. I'd love to see what was going on behind their eyes, but even more than that, I would love to see the expression on their faces when they turned around to come back home after they'd been to Bethlehem, after they gazed at the baby. And now they're making their way back to the fields and there's wonder in their eyes and there's awe in their eyes and there's love in their eyes and there's passion in their eyes and they can't wait for somebody else to know. The Bible says anybody they cross paths with heard the story about where they've been and what they've done. What's the difference? Because when they were going back home, they had experienced it for themselves. It was no longer something somebody had told them about. Even an angel. Now they had been, now they had seen, and now they knew God has sent a Savior. And if there's ever anything that's important at Christmas time, it is that that personal experience be true for each and every one of us in this room, for each of us to be able to say, Now I know. Now I know. Not because somebody told me, not because that's what I've been taught. Not because it's what I believe, but because it's what I have experienced in my own life. I have a Savior. Look through the eyes of the shepherds, but in contrast to the shepherds, we need to look in the eyes of a Bethlehem innkeeper. And here's how his eyes reflected the greatest event in all of human history. His expression would be that of a man distracted by other things. The greatest thing the world had ever seen took place right beside him. And he had too many other things in his mind. You see, I really believe the innkeeper is not a cruel man the way some people betray him. He's not some heartless rogue who would not make room for the Son of God. He's not that guy who stood and gruffly said, Go away! Go away! No room! In fact, I think it was probably kindness, compassion, that caused him to at least find a place in his stable where a young lady about to have her baby and an anxious husband could spend the night. Mostly, he was just a distracted man. They came, they knocked, they saw it, he found them a place to go. And I imagine from that point on, he turned around and he went back to the things he had going on. After all, this was probably the busiest season he had ever known in his life. He had guests that he had to lodge, he had food he had to prepare, he had things that had to be cleaned, he had to take care of the animals in that stable. He was busy. And the truth is, he probably showed Joseph and Mary the way to the stable and then promptly became too busy to ever give them another thought. He never even heard the cry of a newborn infant. He never knew a baby had been born. And he never knew who had been there at his house. And that's what makes the innkeeper such a tragic figure. The Son of God was born in his own backyard and he never knew it. The eyes of the innkeeper are reflected in the expression of many who celebrate Christmas year by year. They go to the parties, they're a part of the programs, they even go to church, but they never really know what Christmas is about. They have eyes that need to see, and yet they're blinded because they're distracted by us. Let's face it, this is a busy, busy season, isn't it? 
And there's so much to think about and so many people to talk to and so many things to accomplish and so many treats to prepare and so many presents to wrap and so many things to buy and so much to do. And if we're not careful, Christmas comes and Christmas goes and two or three days after Christmas is over, you stop and think, we never really made time for Jesus. That is why of all of the services that we enjoy at Christmas, and we enjoy some beautiful things, that musical last night is going to resonate in my heart through the whole season. The things we'll do this evening are going to be fun and important. We're going to have a chance to do ministry as we go to the apartment complex to, to sing and to share Christ. But of all of the things we do at Christmas, it's that Christmas Eve service that means the most to me. Because at Christmas Eve, we're going to gather here and all of the excitement is over and all of the buying is done and all of the celebrating is taking place. And very quietly, we're going to remind ourselves, this is really all about Jesus. Before you can be saved, you have to open your eyes and then you can open your heart. And that innkeeper never opened his eyes. Make sure that your eyes are open this Christmas. Before I close, I want us to look into one more set of eyes. Because in the eyes of Mary and Joseph shine the light of that single bright star. If we were able to see into their eyes, I believe we would see two emotions shining through the expressions of that special couple. First, we would see joy, the kind of joy that you see in the eyes of all new parents when they gaze on their firstborn child. The joy that sees all of birth as a miracle of God. The joy, excuse me, the joy of anticipating the love and the pleasure of helping that child become a man or a woman. We would see joy. But we would also see awe. The awe that of knowing their child was unique in all the world. You know, all of us, when we have a new child, we think the same thing. This is the most special baby that's ever been born. Every newborn parent that I've ever seen, when they gave at their first child, they say, never been anything like this on earth. Never been anything like this again. This most just special child ever born. But only Mary and Joseph knew he truly was the special one. The very Son of God in human flesh. Only they understood the significance of Jesus. Which means God saves. They looked at a baby. And they saw a Savior. Here's the serious and new. The wonder of God's saving grace. Remember again what it was like to say. I once was lost but now I'm found. Like Joseph and Mary. To look at our Savior. And to know who he is. To remember the innkeeper. And not allow ourselves to be distracted by the things that would keep us from seeing the only thing that really matters. It was the promise of the angels born to you this day, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So I ask you a question this morning. Do you see what I see? Do you see a promise fulfilled? Do you see a Savior who has come? And do you see that he came for you? Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a believer. You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. It might be that you could quote me chapter and verse about everything that took place in the Christmas story. But you never have come to that point of saying he came for me. 
And maybe today you need to make it just that personal. If you're not here, if you're here and you're not a believer, today should be the day when you give your life to Jesus. Not tomorrow, not next week, not one of these days, but today. And in a minute when we sing our invitation hymn, if you're here and you know you need Jesus, you come. I'll be here. Dr. Hutchins will be uh, on the other aisle. Either one of us would love to introduce you to Jesus. Or maybe you know this is a place where I need to serve the Lord. And you need to come and join this church and be part of what God is doing through this place. Or maybe there's another decision you need to make. We're going to stand and we're going to sing our invitation hymn. And as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you come. Let's stand together. Let's sing.